Welcome back 46 c owners. This lecture will conclude our discussion of inter-process communication mechanisms in Unix. This won't be the last that we discuss uh, coordination mechanisms and we'll continue to do so when we discuss threads in the near future as a process can spin up multiple independent acting threads of execution and this requires some additional consideration of coordination mechanisms uh, interaction of a few other devices such as mutexes and condition variables. For the moment, you'll want to have a look at the standard IPC uh, facilities that provide IPC uh, in Unix. These are described in Steve Zarego chapter 15 and include things like the semaphore that we were introduced to last time. Uh, and in addition to that, message queues and shared memory. Uh, those usually show up in IPC libraries. We looked at the use of semaphores to coordinate this uh, thought problem, more or less, uh, called the dining philosopher's problem classic concurrency uh, problem, but it's only a model problem, and we'll have some more practical utility for semaphores in our first exercise for the day. A reminder also that Project 2 has been canceled, uh, that you won't have one due prior to next week's Exam 2, that the crux of that exam will be based on what we've discussed in lecture, in lab, and in homeworks. So be do, uh, sort of finishing up uh, homework nine and we'll shortly release uh, the next homework which will uh, demo some IPC mechanisms in particular message queues. We left off last with a discussion of that dining philosopher's problem and the use of semaphores to coordinate up to five processes uh, between each other to ensure that there's well-defined semantics of uh, the different philosophers picking up utensils that are in between them, allowing them to make progress eventually. You also notice that, uh, interesting, at least on Linux systems, uh, these IPC mechanisms through the POSIX library usually have, in addition to an internal program handle, also a spot on the file system that provides some sort of a handle. Uh, in particular, semaphores have a special directory under dev shm, and you'll see names for those semaphores that you create in programs present there. Uh, and this gives you some idea then that Linux in the Unix tradition tries to provide a lot of what is available to users as internal um, operating system state uh, through the, uh, the file system so that you don't have to search around for things. You can actually determine if there are semaphores present on the system and active uh, by looking in this directory. This alleviates the need to have a lot of special system calls and utilities that deal specifically with that stuff. You'd find that's the case in System 5 uh, semaphores. These are an older version, an older IPC library, which had a series of special system utilities to list what semaphores were active. Importantly also then, uh, without cleaning up the semaphores in this philosopher's program, these outlive the program. And this is an important part of the, uh, sorry, the programs that create them, it outlives them. Uh, and this is an important uh, principle for any coordinating mechanism that is to coordinate multiple processes is that this piece of data has to be in some way independent of those processes. Now in truth, it's probably not the case that this is quite like a file and that once I power off and power back on, there's no guarantee that these things will still be around because in all likelihood, they exist in only the temporary RAM memory associated with the operating system while it's powered on versus standard files will have a permanent spot in the file system that persists even beyond a power cycle. So these things look kind of like they're in between something that belongs to a process in memory only, uh, but are not quite at the state of a permanent file. And that will be a common feature of these shared and IPC mechanisms, uh, that in order to be shareable uh, with other processes, they have to exist outside a process uh, to some extent, uh, but they aren't quite as permanent as standard files. Now, the dining philosopher's problem itself is understandable in some ways, uh, but in truth, it's not uh, directly applicable to any real world problem that I'm aware of. You can Google around for this and see there are some similarities of that setting uh, to other things. But let us consider for a moment a much more practical problem uh, where some of this IPC might actually be helpful. Here's a tiny little program that's called append clobber. Its intent in the world uh, is just to open up a file called the file and write a single word into that file, but to do so at the end of the file. 
So you notice here uh, that the file is opened up using standard Unix mechanisms, and the lseek, uh, low-level system call, is utilized to move the position associated with this file to the end of the file. It's there, we'll issue a write, uh, which will uh, hopefully tack a word on to the end of a file uh, and then close up the file. Uh, to demonstrate its use, uh, let me pop over to a terminal. Uh, I'm going to gcc that append clobber. Let's see, and I'm actually going to give this uh, the append clobber name just so I have it. Uh, and if I run append clobber, uh, I'll just say hello. And uh, under the hood, this should have created a little file called the file. Uh, if I, oh, sorry, I had it there already. I need to get rid of it. Uh, let me try that one more time. Uh, so that's gone and now it's back and all that's in there is there is hello. Uh, so if I uh, tack on goodbye with the space in front just to keep it present there, uh, then we have goodbye. And I guess uh, I'm forgetting this uh, appended a new line apparently uh, at the end of it. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, tacking on an additional um, uh, new line there, so we don't need to do that necessarily, and then we'll say like aloha. Um, so you can see uh, as I'm monitoring the file in my text editor, it's growing and appending over there. So this seems all fine and dandy. Let me get rid of uh, the file.txt. It pulls this up in the text editor. Uh, this seems all fine and dandy, even like it's working fine, until you attempt to do something a little bit more um, pressure ridden, I guess. Uh, which is to have a whole bunch of processes simultaneously attempt to execute this program. Uh, for that, it's handy to know a few shell tricks. Uh, shells generally have a looping mechanism in them. And in fact, the shell uh, itself has a fairly robust programming language built into it. And so a command like this, uh, for i in sequence uh, of 100, that'll number uh, create a sequence of 1 to 100, uh, you do the following, which is to run this program. The little ampersand here means uh, to launch it as a background process. So I'll be simultaneously trying to start up about 100 processes that are all attempting to append to the file uh, by writing on to the end of it. So uh, let us look uh, for a moment at how this plays out in, in truth. So over here I will uh, use a for i, I'll generate my sequence of 100, uh, and I'll do the append clobber. Uh, the word that I'm going to write is just i, which is uh, the number, so it'll be a word of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, and so on, up to 100. Uh, and then I'll say done here. Uh, let's say, oh, actually, I have to be careful. Uh, the uh, semicolon here would do this synchronously, uh, but I want to do it uh, asynchronously, so start each of these uh, as its own subprocess. So punch enter, uh, let's see, and... Un Okay, hang on a second. Uh, uh, I, ah, sorry, I forgot the in for I in. Uh, shell syntax is a, a little squirrely there. So you saw a whole lot of output just rifle by here. The first section of output up here uh, is my shell reporting it's starting a child process uh, 24236, a child process 242327. Uh, 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 these are the 100 processes that are being generated over here. And following that are uh, the shell reporting, oh, these child processes, job number one, job number two, up to job 100, uh, they have all finished. Uh, so if I look now at the file, you can see it has uh, some more characters in it. And I uh, rip, um, sort of rifle through here and see a few things that are more or less expected. Uh, that, for instance, uh, the ordering of the numbers in here is unpredictable. Uh, and if I were to run this again, uh, then I'd probably see a different ordering than what shows up here. This is on account of me attempting to start these 100-ish processes. They become subject to the scheduler, which determines when exactly they are going to get to run. Importantly, though, if I scroll to the bottom of this, uh, you can see my line number down here. It's only at 87. And over here, I can uh, verify that if I do a word count on the file, uh, I'll see there are only uh, 86 total lines in this file. And this is problematic because it means some of the processes have their data lost in here. That if I were to sort this and count through, uh, you'd see that there are some missing numbers in here. Uh, some of the 100 processes didn't quite uh, stick for some reason. I want you to take just a moment and consider why this might be happening. 
Uh, this phenomenon is one that you'd probably see in various instances uh, over and over. You did this several times. Uh, for instance, if we remove the file.txt and reran this command and asked uh, what's the word count of this now, uh, it's at 98. And if I were to remove and rerun once again uh, and take a word count, uh, I have 98 again. But this will vary somewhat uh, from run to run, uh, both in terms of the order and how many of these I actually get. Uh, it's important to understand why that is. Uh, so to take a moment and consider why it is that we'd be losing data in this case. All right, spoiler alerts ahead. Uh, we're going to be very specific on this front and outline a situation that could uh, cause the loss of this data. Uh, suppose I just started two processes here. They're both attempting to append to the end and I get them started more or less at the same time. So there are two instances of this program running. Uh, in a multiprocessor uh, situation, like is the present on my laptop, I actually have two cores, so they could run in parallel. Uh, but based on sort of when they could get interrupted by the scheduler and let the other one take terms, the following sequence of events could happen as well, even if I only have a single processor. Both programs uh, go through and open up the file, and both programs uh, see that the file initially is empty. And so a request to the operating system, please move me to the end of the file. It actually just moves uh, the pointer the operating system has for the file forwards by zero bytes. So both uh, process one, two, three and process four, five, six uh, that are gonna attempt to write the number one for one, two, three and the, uh, the number two for four, five, six, uh, they seek to byte position zero in that file because they're both simultaneously seeing an empty file. It's at that point that uh, process uh, 456, which is going to write a 2, it gets to go first uh, or gets ahead just a little bit. Uh, it will uh, figure out how long its word is, uh, write the single 2 in there along with a new line, and then close the file up. Meanwhile, uh, the process 123, uh, it has seen that, uh, or has un completely unaware that the file has actually grown, that it executed this else to see that it's an empty file, and the end of the file is at byte position zero. Uh, so then proceeds to write its one new line right at the very be uh, beginning of the file, and that clobbers uh, or overwrites uh, the two that was put there by process 456. This means then that instead of having two lines of output with a 1, 2, or a 2, 1, I have just a single uh, line of output. And it has to do with when those programs are executing this LSEQ uh, and whether or not they see uh, that the, uh, another process has extended the file somewhat. That if several of them issue an LSEQ and then uh, simultaneously or concurrently uh, attempt to write uh, to it, then they'll overwrite each other's data. It takes a number of processes for this to, to get going, and we saw that even at 100 or so, I'm not losing too much in a lot of cases. Um, however, this is certainly something that you want to avoid, that if losing data is uh, a bad idea in your mind, uh, then we need a mechanism uh, to resolve this. So take a moment and recall how we coordinated access to a shared resource using uh, semaphores in our earlier Dining Philosophers example. Uh, there is the notion of a critical region in a lot of codes, uh, which is to say uh, this region it must be protected because it is accessing and changing a shared resource uh, and uh, needs to be the case that only a single thing is allowed to do this at once. We saw that in the Dynamic Philosophers where the semaphores automatically coordinated uh, the philosophers to the left and the right of an individual utensil so that only one of them could get it. Here, you'll want to think of semaphores as a sort of locking mechanism uh, and identify in here which of this code is uh, essential to sort of block any other process from executing it because it may uh, lead to data loss. So uh, take the, the system calls that we learned to manipulate semaphores and plop some of them down over here uh, to protect uh, what you think of as the critical region. I'll give you just a second uh, to do that and then we'll resume. All right, I'm actually going to pull up the code uh, for this append clobber and make a copy of it. Append clobber, uh, here it is. Uh, let me copy this to append clobber, uh, no clobber sem. How's that? Uh, and we'll open this thing up with some line numbers. Um, so the first thing to probably do is to identify what is the critical region in here. 
Uh, there's potentially some variance for it, but certainly you don't need to protect the entire program from, from doing anything. That really, it's while it's dealing with the file, that's most important. And I'd even uh, venture to say that probably this chunk right here, uh, those are the critical lines because I need to determine based on uh, no one interrupting me, what is the end of the file and then extends uh, the file by writing my word uh, to it. After that, I should be in good shape. So these four lines here, as I've done with them, uh, 30 uh, to 33, should probably be protected. Uh, so let me mark this uh, as uh, begin critical region, and then down here, end critical region. So in order to protect this area, the one IPC mechanism we have at our disposal right now uh, is to make use of a semaphore. Uh, and this is to wait on the semaphore, which uh, gives me exclusive access to the semaphore. And that allows me to then uh, guarantee that the process that acquires the semaphore is the only one that's going to be executing this. And then post to release the semaphore afterwards. Retreating the semaphore then is a, a very simple lock. So uh, to start that code out, I just have a sem wait call up here. Uh, I need some sem uh, to be right here, and then a sem post uh, over here to release that semaphore and allow some other process uh, to acquire it. Importantly, uh, there are a few other calls uh, that I need to fish out in order to get the, the there. Uh, to that end, I'm just going to turn back over to the philosopher's problem uh, and recall that open and close bit of business that I needed. Uh, so here's sem open, and I need a name for that. Uh, so prior to this, uh, I will open it up, uh, sem open. I need a name for this thing. Uh, and so I'll pick up here something like this. Uh, sem name, and I'll just pick uh, uh, the sem uh, for uh, something like that. And if I remember right, I also have to, I'm obligated according to the POSIX standard to start this with a slash for some non-intuitive reason. Okay, uh, so sem open there, uh, and then probably after that I'd have a sem close down here. And if I remember right, uh, I need to have a handle for this thing. So up here, this will be uh, sem t sem equals this. And I can't remember if it's a pointer or if it's something else. Uh, it looks like a bunch of sem t pointers here. So I'll give this a little star. Okay, I think that's a pretty good start to this. Um, there's one non-intuitive uh, aspect to this that we need to address as well, and that if I compile this code and it might compile uh, and then ran it, uh, what we find is that the semaphore doesn't actually work the way that we want it to because nothing in here has initialized it. And in truth, there's probably not an easy way um, to do that in here uh, because uh, we would need to have some special activity associated with uh, that, that semaphore. Um, so let me put one more um, sort of uh, caveat to this uh, uh, a bit of code, uh, which is to have a special initialization operation. And this will save me uh, two bits of trouble and that it will clear out this file uh, and then establish the semaphore initially. Uh, so down here, I'm just going to have a little if check. If my first argument, uh, which is uh, the word, let's see, and have heard stir comp uh, word is equal to init. Uh, then in that case, I am going to, let's see, uh, call this uh, sem init. And we will call this on sem. Uh, we'll call, let's see, p shared is just one, and then I'll initialize it to a value of one. Uh, and I'll also, let's see, uh, going to be let's see, right in this here. And I just want to uh, make sure that um, if that file is uh, present already to get rid of it so that it's um, that we don't get sort of corrupted output on that front. Uh, so in terms of organization there, uh, I'm going to rearrange this just a little bit up here. And then here we'll call, uh, I think it's remove call on file name. 
Uh, that'll get rid of that file uh, so that if I'm initializing, it's an empty file. And then the next uh, open down here, that's going to create it. Okay, uh, let's see how we're doing here. I'm going to attempt first to compile this. Uh, GCC, uh, let's see, append no clobber. Uh, let's see, append no clobber. Let's call that. And this is append no clobber sem. Uh, as we learned earlier, I believe I need, you need to link the pthreads library in order to uh, install all the functions associated with uh, semaphores. So we'll GCC that. We're good to go there. Okay, so first then I will do this uh, append no clobber uh, and pass in that init thing. That doesn't do anything, but I can see if there is a semaphore in that uh, dev uh, shma now and... Let's see, something share, there's some uh, various things in here, but I'm not seeing the one that I was actually looking for here. So hang on a second. Uh, this is the semaphore. Um, so name, let's see. Uh, well, actually that, the, <laughs> that concerns, oh, I forgot to close it though. <laughs> uh, and uh, do a bunch of other stuff. Okay, so this is like a messed up in, in a number of reasons. Uh, so let me sem close. Uh, and then I'm actually going to return uh, zero in this case because I don't want to append anything. Okay, right, recompile that. And then over here, uh, I'll try that one more time. And list and hope and still nothing. Okay, let me pause for a second and sort out what I'm doing wrong here. Okay, I think all is well. It's just that I was thrown off a little bit by the fact that this uh, renamed the semaphore as sem dot the semaphore. Uh, so it's present there and we should be in good shape. Uh, to that end then, I think we're in good shape. So I've initialized. Uh, if I cat out the file, uh, let's see, right now, the file, oh, actually, no, it's not gonna be created because it's only gonna be created uh, after I um, start running things here and get creation, so that's fine. Uh, there is no uh, the file.txt. And so if I come back here and do the append no clobber then, uh, which is gonna make use of that semaphore to coordinate, uh, run through this thing and I'll ask uh, the, the file.txt. Uh, yeah, there's a hundred total lines in there. Again, as I would look at them, uh, there would be an unpredictable ordering that's in here. But importantly, I haven't lost any data. And if I were to run this again, then I'd say uh, expect there to be 200 total lines on that front. Um, so the semaphore then uh, allows in the code that we have here, uh, there to be uh, protected regions of code that only one process is executing at a time. And this is generally done to make sure that shared resources like a file uh, can be manipulated in a safe way. Uh, so that's only a single process is looking at its state, altering the state, and when, when it's safe for others to proceed, uh, it releases the semaphore uh, down here to do so. In the code pack, uh, you'll see something that looks like that. And in addition, uh, there is a separate program uh, that does the initialization part. Uh, but it should be said that semaphores aren't the only game in town for this particular instance. Uh, the most obvious uh, kind of alternative is the notion of a file lock. And Unix has a couple different systems uh, to allow for this. Uh, in particular, the lockf function allows something like a semaphore-like action to be done, uh, but to a specific file. Uh, so as in, uh, if I were modifying a single file and I had several different processes doing so, uh, this lockf function could be called uh, in order to acquire some operating system resource that was exclusive and behaves in a semaphore-like way. If five different processes are attempting to call this lock at nearly the same time, the operating system only gives the lock on an individual file to one of them and the other four get blocked until the lock is released by whoever has it. The operating system then selects another process to go forwards. So this uh, notion of modifying files according to, um, uh, or potentially unsafe ways and needing to coordinate that um, has been around for quite a while, and there are file-specific locking mechanisms that are out there. Semaphores are a little more general than that, and that you could say, for instance, have three or four different files, uh, and if you wanted to edit all of them uh, in a potentially destructive way and had to coordinate multiple folks, you could have a single semaphore that more or less controls access to all of those. 
that requires all of the participating processes to be aware of that protocol. As in, if they don't know that they're supposed to acquire the semaphore or lock the file first, uh, there's nothing protecting uh, them from, from doing, uh, uh, protecting the file from them just bypassing that protocol and going ahead and modifying them anyway. But generally, that's the case in all sort of systems level programming that you set up these systems in such a way that the participating entities all have to know what the protocol is and adhere to it for things to work. Uh, the other broad solution to this is to ask the OS to coordinate in the specific append fashion that we um, have. There is an open flag called oAppend if you look in uh, the uh, open uh, manual page as you open up files. You can actually ask the OS to convert the way it usually tracks uh, the um, file position for an individual um, file descriptor for a process uh, to modify that so that it's always reading the ending position and all processes that are writing to that file automatically append to it uh, via write. Uh, this is specific to the append situation that we're in here and won't work in other cases uh, that we'll see uh, soon. And I'll mention that uh, there. But um, the semaphore solution here, while simple and sort of elegant, isn't the only game in town on that front. Uh, the advantage of the file locking is that you don't need this independent semaphore uh, and don't need to do any independent initialization, but uh, this is still, I think, a good illustration and practice uh, for the use of semaphores that we've seen previously. The next piece of interprocess communication that we'll want to discuss uh, isn't so much a coordination mechanism, but a broad ability to do sharing of data between processes. We've seen that there's this ability for areas in a program's virtual memory image to be mapped to sort of arbitrary stots by the file system. And one of the tools that we saw there is you can ask the operating system to map some area of your own memory into the OS memory associated with a file. Well, it turns out you don't actually need a file to do this. You can just ask the OS to map some block of your address space uh, to some block of RAM uh, to make use of. Now, why you'd want to do that uh, in sort of a roundabout fashion versus just malloking something on the heap that you're going to use usually has to do with uh, the want to share things. And so our next portion here is going to discuss this notion of shared memory. And it's going to feel, again, a little bit weird because this hunk of shared memory that we'll be able to set up for a couple of different files or a couple of different processes rather to look at, it sort of smacks of a shared file in some ways. And we'll underscore that similarity in just a moment once we get our um, sort of basic framework worked, worked out. And for that, I'm gonna turn our attention to this program, uh, Shma Demo, uh, POSIX, which illustrates the shared memory uh, paradigm in POSIX. That's over here, Shma Demo POSIX. Blow this up and give us some line numbers. Uh, so at the top, you can see a bunch of headers, and one feature of this program is that it has a bunch of different flags to sort of init and show and watch and do different activities within the same program. Uh, and this smacks of our earlier solution uh, to the semaphore business in that there's some amount of initialization one has to do on the front. Uh, the basic setup to create a piece of shared memory that can be accessed not just by one process but by several uh, is to first establish a name uh, for that piece of shared memory. And this, like semaphores, will start with a slash. Uh, we saw earlier I've already been experimenting with this stuff, uh, but importantly, there's an option to delete or unlink uh, this stuff. And I'll probably exercise that early on so that we aren't in a, a corrupted state. Um, if you want to create and uh, utilize this thing uh, from the outset, though, uh, the first thing you'll need is a file descriptor. And this is where the first shared memory uh, open uh, system call comes in. Uh, you make use of this thing very much as you would the open uh, system call to open files. Uh, you have a name, you have some options, and you have some permissions. All of these are almost exactly the same as what they are in the open for file equivalents. And this is not a mistake. Again, we learned earlier that one of the uh, stances that the POSIX shared memory library took, uh, it, so the POSIX IPC uh, library took, is to try to utilize as much as possible the same semantics that are present in the file system uh, in order to make it familiar to users and reduce the amount of cognitive load uh, to work with these things. 
So the fact that this thing is listed as a file descriptor and uses uh, the open semantics uh, is intended. And essentially what this is gonna do is establish in memory someplace a block uh, of RAM uh, that is treated kind of like what the file system uses internally to store uh, caches of disk files. But instead this piece of memory is not backed by a disk file at all. There's one other sort of weird looking uh, function call here. Uh, the F truncate function is used to change the size of files. And in this case, since by default, the file descriptor I get for this shared piece of memory has size zero, it's important uh, that I initially establish a size for it. Uh, that's according to this pound defined constant. We're using something relatively small, like 64 bytes here, although you can use whatever size you want, big or small on that front. Uh, so this call then will adjust the size that the operating system has for that block of RAM uh, that's associated with this file descriptor. Now, with a file descriptor in hand, the proper way then to acquire this main memory uh, or this uh, memory so that you can utilize it as if it were an in-memory array, for instance, is to use mmap. Uh, in truth, you could actually make use of the system calls like uh, write and read and so forth with this file descriptor, I believe. Uh, but the general setup for this is instead uh, to acquire the file descriptor, set the size, uh, and then use mmap uh, on the file descriptor. Uh, along with the set of options that we have typically seen before when we were memory mapping files. Uh, again, the only difference is going to be that there is no uh, underscoring disk file that's backing this piece of RAM up. Uh, once it's, uh, you see a power off, uh, then that RAM uh, was, is going to be completely gone. However, this file descriptor is going to outlive this program unless I get rid of it uh, somehow. Uh, that's that unlinking process up here. After that, then, I can more or less do whatever I want with this uh, memory map image. Uh, for instance, plop data down in it, uh, watch what it contains, uh, show what's in there, uh, and change what's in there. Uh, so the rest of the code here is fairly mundane. It's just a set of switches to look for. Am I initializing this? In which case, I'll treat it like a big string and plop down dashes in there along with a null terminator to make it easy to printf. Uh, if it's uh, to show, then I'll just print out what the contents are of it. Uh, we're going to skip this watch, which is just sort of a convenience to watch what's changing in there. And then the final thing down here is I can uh, plop down a couple options according to up here. I want to put this data in at this position in it. Uh, so the data in this case is a string uh, and the position is just an integer within it. And I'll copy the characters from that string uh, into that. Uh, after one of these actions is done, initializing, changing, showing, etc., uh, I'll unmap uh, the memory uh, and we'll see that that persists yet. So uh, let us look quickly then at this thing in action. Here's a GCC Shorshma demo, POSIX. Uh, and here you'll need to understand that in addition to uh, the pthreads library, some of this functionality uh, exists in a uh, real-time library, libRT. And so to get the uh, POSIX shared memory calls to be defined, uh, you'll need to link against that. Uh, and let me uh, just call this shma demo um, as the output program because I don't want to, to use some other name in it uh, to sort of demonstrate a few things. So here's sh uh, shma demo. Uh, and I'm going to first delete uh, the piece of memory uh, that's up there, and then I'm going to initialize it. Uh, so if I list what's up in that dev shma directory now, you'll see that there's this thing called something shared. Um, I'll know it's not a semaphore because it doesn't start with that uh, irritating semaphore uh, prefix. Uh, and that the name that I ch uh, chose for uh, my piece of shared memory is here uh, called something shared. Uh, I don't know if we can get any more uh, data on it, uh, but oh yeah, it's actually listed here as 64 bytes as though it were a file. Uh, and if I were to run the little invocation here to show what's in there, uh, you'd see it's all dashes right now. Uh, and if I were to cat out that file, uh, you'd see, let's see, uh, something shared. Uh, you'd see that most of what's in there uh, are dashes along with a null terminator uh, at the end, which my terminal has a little bit of difficulty, um, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, a little bit of difficulty displaying. So uh, let us go about actually plopping something down here. Uh, one of the invocations I could use is to put data like hello, uh, and I'll just put this at position 10 in here. 
Uh, and if I sort of show what's present in there now, you'll see that this hello has been um, um, plopped out. Uh, and uh, this should be a sign then that the change I made to this piece of RAM is actually persistent. It lives beyond this one program. Uh, however, if I were to go to the trouble of cycling power on this, uh, then you'd probably see that this uh, data is lost, that the operating system doesn't persist it beyond that. Um, however, this does make it possible for multiple programs to edit this thing, uh, and is, you know, though it were like a file, uh, for instance, I'll run another instance of a uh, Shmuda demo, and here at line, uh, position 30, I'll plop down uh, a goodbye, and, or good ibe, I guess, I guess, it, I guess I could respell that thing, uh, and uh, show it, and so you see some stuff in there. Now this is you know, sort of uninteresting at this point because uh, this thing seems to behave very much like a file. And again, we'll emphasize uh, that correspondence uh, very shortly. Uh, but the first thing that's uh, sort of interesting about this is now we have uh, this little area of memory that acts like an array uh, of characters in this case, and multiple processes can bang on it at once. And so the first thing that we'll uh, maybe want to do is to sort of play around with this and see what the, the limits of it are. To that end, we're going to turn our attention to a slight variant of this program. Uh, it's in sharedflip.c. Uh, in this case, uh, the intent of the program is to establish a little block of memory uh, that is either all zeros or all ones, and maintains that property that it's either all zeros or all ones. Uh, you can look at what's in there, uh, or you can pass this little dash flip option, which is going to change all of the shared memory to uh, from zeros to ones, or if they're ones, uh, to zeros instead. Now the question we're going to ask after we get acquainted with this program is, what happens if you have multiple programs simultaneously trying to do this? Um, if they're all acting sort of in good faith, I should never have a mixture of zeros and ones in the, um, the, the shared memory block. Uh, this should all, either be all zeros because a program came along and flipped all of them, uh, or it should have all ones because uh, it was ones uh, or, uh, or was zeros and some program came along and flipped them. Uh, and each concurrent run of those should flip all the zeros to ones or all the ones to zeros. There should never be a mixture on that. Let's see how this works uh, in principle here. Uh, so first, uh, that shared flip.c program. Uh, this has a similar structure uh, to what we had examined already, uh, where I'm going to make use of this something shared uh, thing over here. Uh, and there's also going to be a lock at stake uh, later on. Uh, but generally, this flip operation over here uh, looks like the following. Uh, that if I am to be flipping, uh, then I'll just rifle through all the memory that's present there. If it's a zero, uh, change it to ones. Uh, otherwise, if it's a one, change it to zeros. And if it's something else, uh, then I'm just not going to bother uh, changing it at all. Uh, so on that front, let me GCC that. C, uh, let's see, share, shared flip.c. Uh, and I'll call this uh, shared flip, and I think I'll need both the p thread for the eventual semaphore that we'll introduce and the uh, real-time library. Uh, so let me then uh, run this thing and get usage for it. Uh, so I'll initialize it uh, and then plop out this show here. Uh, let's see. Uh, actually, let me delete first and then init. Uh, Delete and then init uh, and then show. Hmm, interesting. I seem to have a bug in here of some kind. Uh, let me look for my show. Okay, so apparently I called it something else in here. Uh, it's uh, uh, hmm. Maybe I, I've uh, eliminated that. I'll pause for just a second and I'd fix this quick. All right, so that uh, just in the process of uh, flipping things back and forth, I got a little bit unhinged myself and uh, had accidentally eliminated the show uh, variant of this. It's back now, uh, so we should be in good shape. Uh, as I would look at that shared memory segment uh, and then uh, execute this flip and look at the show again, uh, you see all ones here. So the intent of this program is like very simple, like uh, flip bits on that front. 
uh, I'll show this time. Uh, so one thing to sort of recognize right off the bat is that if I flip an odd number of times, there should be ones total, uh, it, or all ones in here. If I flip an even number of times, there should be all zeros in here. Um, so of course, we're gonna put some pressure on this uh, by attempting the same tactic we did before. Let's try and do this a lot of times. Uh, now, this doesn't always work the first couple times. Uh, I'm gonna try 400 processes because that's a lot of pressure. Uh, and uh, shared flip here. But this is gonna start uh, concurrently 400 different processes that are all attempting to do this flipping operation. And what we'll find if we're lucky in this uh, sort of first uh, portion of this um, is that uh, we'll see uh, that as I would show what's in here, uh, this didn't work that time, I may take a couple tries here, uh, but eventually I should get uh, something that uh, looks wrong on that front. Uh, all right, so <laughs> being a, a little turd for me right now, but <clears throat> there it is. Okay, cool. Um, so you have to get unlucky to some extent, and this is what we observed earlier in terms of uh, concurrency issues is that it could seem to work like a lot of times until finally at one fell swoop things fall apart on you. And you see here, uh, despite flipping 400 times, the even number of times, it should give me uh, an even number of, uh, or sorry, all zeros uh, present in here. But at this stage, I have some combination of ones and zeros. Something has been corrupted. Uh, it's important to understand why this would happen. Uh, and so over here, in terms of the code for that shared flip, as you would be going through and doing this flip operation, uh, down here, what you'd be seeing is that competing processes, uh, as they would see a zero uh, and then change it to a one, or a one and then change it to a zero, they could actually be interrupted in the midst of this uh, process. Um, so one process that at the moment it sort of checked, there was a zero there, uh, gets interrupted because, uh, and so that the next, uh, ne uh, sorry, stop by the scheduler. So the next instruction is gonna execute uh, is just change it to one uh, instruction. Uh, but while it's running, some other process comes along and starts making changes to it so that what uh, this process was looking at, which was a zero, uh, changes to a one itself. So it plops a one down there as well. Uh, and this is no good. Uh, this is now sort of discoordinated in terms of uh, the process is not, um, uh, they're all competing and, and stepping on each other's feet, uh, sort of overriding data in here. Uh, so on that front, the best way to protect this critical region is as we did before, just surround it by a locking mechanism such as a semaphore. And this is the reason that up top we had some semaphores uh, present uh, is that we'll just uh, open up the semaphore, uh, call a sem wait here, and this will allow me uh, then to guarantee that this critical region where I'm flipping bits, uh, it is only going to be done by one process at a time. Now you can see that this actually introduces a little bit of shakiness or uh, inefficiency in the system. Uh, so it should say it removes all the shakiness. So if I were to uh, reinitialize this thing uh, and then uh, do my 400s of flips, but do the lock flip uh, variant. Uh, that's the command associated with the semaphore version of this over here. Uh, and over here, I'll run that. And just for uh, sort of a couple times, I'll run it to, to spin up a lot of processes uh, and then show what's in here. Uh, then you'll see it's still very much uh, um, zeros. If I were to do this uh, 401 times, uh, then I should see all ones in there. Uh, and yeah, I see all ones. Uh, that by virtue of this protection mechanism, uh, this shared memory block is protected uh, just for only a single process to be uh, executing and changing its bits uh, or the characters in it rather uh, at one time. Uh, so this generally means then that any shared resource uh, you'll want to protect. And one easy mechanism to do it is uh, via this uh, semaphore. Uh, now, it doesn't really matter in this case whether we're working on a shared memory block or um, a standard file. Uh, semaphores uh, can serve you on that front. But the use of a shared memory block, a block here is uh, always going to be efficient. There's no writing of the operating system back to the file system associated with it. 
And it also precludes the use of a file lock then because there isn't necessarily a file lock associated with a shared memory block like this anymore. So Sentinel 4 is our, uh, to some extent, more the only game in town on this front. And since we weren't doing a pending, there's no fancy open uh, uh, option that will help me on that front. Uh, now, I was mentioning this uh, issue of efficiency here, that essentially we've taken a, a very big sort of step to lock the entire file using the Sentinel 4, go through, make all the changes, and then unlock it. Um, you could envision sort of uh, something a little bit more fine-grained than that, that instead of outside the loop over here, uh, I actually just protect the check and change operation on the inside. Uh, this will result in uh, not locking the entire file at a time, uh, but a whole lot more locking and unlocking uh, of waiting and posting on the semaphore. The OS can handle this uh, still fairly efficiently, uh, in my experience, but uh, this might be, you can start to see, like, it might do some overhead associated with uh, locking and unlocking a lot uh, in this respect. We'll discuss that more later on in the context of UTEXs, uh, but usually practical systems are somewhere in between uh, this approach and this approach, where uh, I'm not going to lock the entire file, but I'm also not going to lock uh, things on a sort of per change basis that uh, most standard locking mechanisms that would be used, for instance, in database systems uh, where you have to coordinate multiple actors reading and writing the database. They will uh, attempt to lock regions of the database uh, that are of interest. And as soon as they're done with the region, they'll release it. So anyone who's waiting on reading or writing that region uh, gets access to it sooner. This allows other uh, parts, other processes that are dealing with other parts of the big database file uh, to continue operating and not have to worry about interfering with the locked portion so long as they're not touching uh, that portion that is locked. So this gives a sense then of what's possible uh, with the uh, notion both of the shared memory uh, and the play that semaphores have here to coordinate uh, shared memory accesses because there's nothing special the operating system does uh, to protect those uh, from discoordinated changes. It's worthwhile just to consider quickly uh, the differences between shared memory and memory mapped files. And we alluded to this relationship to that uh, you have a memory mapped file and it combines sort of the best aspects of uh, the on-disk storage with the ability to access something as though it were a program uh, variable. Uh, and this was done through that mmap uh, system call. Uh, the POSIX shared memory changes this in that it gives you this sort of memory mapped region, but it's not backed by any disk file. And so a natural question that arises is when you would want that feature. And it generally boils down to that decision. If you don't want some sort of synced permanent storage that's associated with standard files, uh, then shared memory is probably a good choice. Uh, the usage of RAM in order to coordinate activities is probably more efficient uh, and avoids the cost then of syncing at regular intervals that the operating system always does with files. On the other hand, if you need uh, permanent uh, storage or some sort of backing of the file system on this run, then me a memory map file that's shared between several processes is probably uh, appropriate. A related uh, concept to this is something called a RAM disk, uh, which you can actually create a whole file system in RAM rather than on disk. And this is oftentimes what is used as you would use some little USB key to plug into a computer and it loads a whole operating system, it, is that it creates the file system for that operating system in RAM instead of on permanent storage, as uh, this allows then the tiny little USB stick uh, to uh, bootstrap the computing system uh, forwards uh, to get things running. I'll let you guys read the linked Wikipedia article about this uh, on your own if you're so inclined. So then, we don't have a lot of time, but the last sort of thing uh, that I'd like to talk about uh, is message queues. There's an exercise in here that discusses uh, just sort of a thought experiment uh, that adapts uh, if we had this email lookup server that's present in homework nine, uh, present and wanted to make use of shared memory for it. It goes through some exercises uh, to sort of think about how one might do that and coordinate activities, uh, but I'll leave that to you uh, as a review exercise if you're so inclined. Uh, but let's have a look at this final piece that we said that most uh, Unix traditional IPC libraries, they provide semaphores, shared memory, and message queues. 
And the last one here is going to feel somewhat familiar. Uh, that message queues share a lot of structure with the FIFOs or pipes that we have talked about so far. That essentially uh, message queues formalize just a little bit the FIFO kinds of semantics. Uh, and so that writing to a FIFO is going to be very much like a message queue send. And reading from a FIFO is going to be very much like a message queue receive. What we saw there is that uh, message queue or uh, writing to a FIFO has the operating system automatically serialize the data that's going into that FIFO so nothing is lost. Multiple processes attempting to write to the FIFO, they all move that, uh, their data in and uh, uh, are automatically coordinated so nothing is lost. So too will be the case with message queues. And uh, reading allows one process to get something out of a FIFO. Uh, so too, a uh, message queue uh, will be serialized in that fashion. Uh, one difference is that the operating system doesn't enforce the same set of open uh, semantics uh, as it does with FIFOs. That for message queues, uh, you can have only one end open or have no partner that's uh, ostensibly sending or receiving with you on message queues, uh, which leads uh, the programs not to block in the same way that they did on opening FIFOs. Uh, the other major difference is that there's just a little bit of additional structure enforced on message queues uh, so that you write arbitrary amounts of data to FIFOs. Uh, however, messages uh, in, or message queues divide data into messages. So as you ask for one message, you might get five bytes. And as you ask for the next message, you might get 100 bytes of data instead. Uh, let's look at a very simple demonstration program of this, uh, which just smacks a little bit of what the potential is there. Uh, and we'll turn to a later homework uh, to explore some, some more detail how those message queues work. Uh, to that end, let me pull up uh, the message Kirk POSIX and message Spock POSIX, uh, which are going to be two communication programs that allow uh, talking. Uh, and they're unrelated processes, so uh, one won't need to have them uh, share anything in the process tree. Uh, let me find this message Kirk POSIX and message Spock POSIX. Uh, these are adapted from an original version uh, that is in Beej's guide to uh, IPC. Uh, you can find that online uh, someplace. Uh, let's see, just search for Beej and IC, uh, IPC, that's B-E-E-J. Uh, he has a number of interesting uh, programming tutorials that are worth uh, looking at. Um, so. Up here, we'll walk through these sort of coordinated to each other. Uh, Kirk is going to be a program that the user is allowed to type into. And Spock is going to be a program that just responds in a sort of canned uh, chatbot fashion uh, to those. Uh, to facilitate this, uh, there is a message queue that is directed at Spock and a message queue that is directed at Kirk. And you can see uh, there are some open type semantics uh, here as well. Uh, MQ open, these have, again, names, again, permissions that are associated with how to create what's going to be done with them uh, and whether or not uh, or the permissions associated with uh, who can read and write these things. Uh, there's also an attributes parameter over here that dictates um, how much uh, data you want to be uh, to enable this message queue uh, to contain uh, before you start blocking uh, folks from, from uh, adding to it. And so uh, while FIFOs have a fixed size of 64 kilobytes, you can actually uh, enforce different limits on message queues, which gives them slightly more uh, flexibility, both in terms of how many messages are in there and what the maximum size of a message uh, is. The uh, operating system will allocate the uh, internal data associated with those message queues uh, that is sized appropriately for that. We'll just use, uh, for both of these message queues, uh, the same amount of um, storage, uh, 10 messages and a max len uh, uh, here. So uh, down here is the main loop uh, for uh, the Kirk program. And basically, it's an input loop um, and that will read something from the user uh, and then send it off as a message uh, to Spock. And you see the MQ send here has a very similar flavor to a write. Uh, that there is something like a file descriptor here, something like a buffer uh, that I'm sending, and that buffer is listed just up here. It's a little character buffer. It has a max len that matches what the maximum length, uh, length associated with the message queue messages is. Uh, and then just a couple extra options that can change the behavior of the message queue send. The correspondence of this to a write in the call semantics, the file descriptor, what to write and how much to write, uh, is intentional again. 
uh, after writing, uh, the Kirk program is just going to receive a message, so it'll block until it gets something, uh, some sort of response, uh, and then uh, sort of uh, tout out what was there. Uh, if something goes wrong with this, as is the case for most system calls, MQ receive returns a minus one. Uh, when I bail out of this loop by pressing Control D to signal, or not signal, uh, to indicate end of input, uh, then I'll just close up both the message keys. Similarly, over here in Spock, uh, the loop is not one of inputs uh, from user, but just waiting for a message from Kirk and then replying uh, using a sort of canned uh, uh, prescribed um, a sort of uh, illogical uh, response uh, to it. Uh, and this will run until I actually have to kill the program. So let me fire this up in a couple shells here. Uh, over here, I want to GCC. I'll call this just Kirk, uh, message Kirk uh, POSIX. And I think I need the real time raw library for this, yeah. Uh, and then over here, let's see. Uh, I'll start another shell. And I'll do the same thing, except here, Kirk will become Spock. Uh, and now then I'll start the Spock sort of thing uh, and cart the Kirk thing here. Uh, this I'll just type some uh, messages like hello uh, and Spock will receive that and then send a response back uh, to the captain. Uh, and I'm seeing something is wrong on, on that front uh, because uh, this should have contained uh, a um, hello down here. So bugs in the program, which I'll try to, to fix up uh, if I get that. Uh, okay, so we're off by one now. I've uh, screwed something up on, on, on this part as I was messing around with the programs prior to this. Uh, but you get the general picture here that I type things like I uh, beam me up. Uh, and if I send this, I get the um, response back eventually on, on that front. Um, importantly, if I kill this program over here, uh, I can continue to, to some extent, uh, work with this thing that unlike FIFOs, despite this program having gone away and not being there to issue receives, uh, the Spock sort of program uh, over here, or the Kirk program can continue to operate. And, uh, and uh, to that end, uh, some of the semantics here are going to block until it receives response. If I fire Spock back up, uh, then it will retrieve the messages that are present and respond uh, and uh, we can sort of carry on on that front. So the semantics then in message queues are a little bit more flexible than what they are in FIFOs, although a lot of structure is shared on that front. Uh, we've seen then that you can size them a little bit differently uh, using parameters, and uh, you can also rely upon partner programs uh, that those partner programs can go away, uh, and this will not affect necessarily the program at the other end of the message queues. Um, that's the semantics there are still clear and this doesn't cause a uh, pipe signal or anything like that uh, for FIFOs. That said, they're probably implemented under the hood using very similar mechanisms that every time you send a message, you just tack something on to a ring buffer. Uh, and when you are checking, uh, the operating system will take whatever the most recent message is there. So there are a bunch of other tricks associated with uh, the message queues, such as sort of timed waits uh, and non-blocking behaviors, things we don't necessarily have time to get into right now, uh, but uh, they're a somewhat underutilized facility that can simplify greatly uh, some of the pieces uh, to set up communication between different programs there. Uh, we'll explore that in a homework where we revisit that email server using message queues. And this will, I think, underscore some more of their potential because we'll look at a direct correspondence between we did it this way with pipes in an earlier homework and this way with uh, message queues in uh, this later homework. That covers most of the IPC mechanisms that are present in standard Unix libraries. Uh, this is our sort of first foray then into uh, coordinating mechanisms, and in particular the semaphore. We're very going to soon going to see uh, some uh, alternatives to that in the form of mutexes, uh, which are a locking mechanism that uh, creates mutual exclusion, as evidenced by the name. Uh, but we'll deal with that more as they're associated more with threads. Uh, and that's our next unit post-exam.
Until then, uh, I hope everyone is happy and healthy. And keep in mind that this is the end of content that could potentially be on next week's exam. Uh, so study up and have a look at these new IPC mechanisms. If you want to read more, uh, there's some general information out there in manual pages, an overview of uh, IPC and a guide. Uh, and if you're looking to round out your understanding uh, that won't be on the exam necessarily, but are curious about these older uh, System 5 IPCs, I mentioned this BEEJ guide is useful for that, as well as the internal uh, Linux documentation. All right, I'll see you guys hopefully in lecture discussion uh, and next week in exam preparations. So long for now.